Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution, <laughs> the show where we talk about politics, culture, economics, we tell bad jokes, and we try to keep it real. Rosanna, Michael, Anita, and Scott. Good, Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning. Scott, you're going a little bit great there, buddy, but what can I say, you know? <laughs> Better than having no hair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if so I could pull off that bald look, Joe. I would go for it, but I think well, my head's ear shaped and my ears stick out. So, what was the name of the basketball player, the Chicago Bulls, who won, who was tremendous athlete and personality, uh, who was bald headed? Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. oh, well. Michael, when he went bald, it was a great relief to me. You know. <laughs> uh, but everybody started kind of came in style. It came in style and. And I was such so vain. Uh, you, you remember that song from the 60s, Rosanna, mm. Anita, you're so vain. You bet, bet you think oh, this yeah. song was about you. <laughs> that was me. Carly Simon. <laughs> and I, I would, I would had a big afro and it would blow. And, and when I started to lose my hair, the ball sparks would appear. <laughs> anyway, we're not, we're not, this show is not about my uh, balding, uh, <laughs> no. my bald headed uh, anxiety. It's about revolution and struggle and the struggle for democracy. And there's been a big assault on democracy by uh, the right wing and the court system. Uh, Rosanna, are abortion rights about to disappear? I don't know. Um, Sotomayor made a really good point yesterday asking, you know, are we just appealing to some to, I think it was the some of these uh, states that are saying that, in the, in essence, they're referring to the fact that they have the support in the Supreme Court now because of the new court judges, and does and she asked the question, does that lose our credibility as as Supreme Court justices? And my answer is yes, it does. It already mm. has. So, I think we should uh, push on that, you know. That, that the Supreme Court should stay neutral and stick to the Constitution and uh, and not be pandering to, you know, to the right wing. It diminishes the authority of the court. You exactly. Think. Anita, what's your take? It, it, it legitimates, it uh, diminishes the legitimacy of the court, but unfortunately it doesn't uh, legitimate its actual authority, its actual power. And I think um, this will be, I, I really think Roe is doomed from what people are saying this week about the way the judges, the new three new uh, Trump appointees, the questions they were asking. I think Judge Roberts tried to steer a middle course and the right wing was not interested in that middle course. It looks really bad. And I think what's gonna have to happen is women are gonna have to organize and that's what has happened around the world. When when women really make demands, you know, they they can get heard. And I, I think it just needs to, you know, get to the that activist point. And I also think women will make ways. I mean, there are medical abortion uh, uh, options. Um, you know, I think that women have stepped in to to you know help other women at times like this. But I think we really have to organize and demand that uh, right to control over our own bodies. It's just so basic. I really like the argument that the um, the Mississippi clinic was making. Uh, the the attorney for that uh, for the clinic was saying um, that it really to overturn Roe would mean women don't fully participate in society. And I really believe that's true. To to be forced to carry a, an unwanted pregnancy to term and then. Uh, Coney Barrett's uh, idea is just, you know, well, let, bring it, the child up for adoption. But that's just like, it's a traumatic event all around. Um, so I really think it's a crisis point in the uh, reproductive rights sphere right now. And at the same as much time, as this is a general democratic issue, isn't it a class issue as well? I mean, isn't it like affecting poor and working class women disproportionately? Oh, I think so. Um, if I, you know, I don't know. Uh, 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 our comrade uh, has a great article in People's World that it, the fight against abortion bans is a 
working class fight because working class women will be the ones most affected. I'm sorry if I jumped in here. No, it's okay. Scott? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, you know, um, uh, working class uh, women in the first place, but also um, their partners and their families. Um, and, you know, this is a, this impacts all uh, working class people. And we have to remember as well that Roe is important. And if it's, if it's overturned, it'll be a setback, but abortion is already uh, inaccessible. Uh, the, the, the right to reproductive autonomy and control over your own body doesn't, already does not exist for millions and millions of women in states where there are you know, only one or two abortion clinics uh, where you know, um, they would have to pay out of pocket, where they don't have a way to get transportation, um, where you know, uh, uh, there are you know, obstacles to getting birth control, all of these things. To, like, so it is about preserving Roe, but it's, that's just one that's just one small part of the actual fight for reproductive choice, for, for freedom and for the democratic rights of, uh, of women. Um, and, and, and that's what our fight is. And you know, it's like Lenin said, um, we're fighting for the rights that capitalist democracy promises, but can't fulfill, right? And, and it's gonna take something like, like universal healthcare, I think, to fully protect uh, reproductive choice. Are we on a slow march towards, you know, they're eliminating right after right after right, Michael. And it's like creeping, uh, creeping, uh, my voice squeaked a little bit there, creeping fascism. I mean, and I had the nerve, Rosanna, you heard it. There was some guy who attacked one of our comrades in Los Angeles and attacked the party in Los Angeles because we were going to the women's march and they said, how can you, this was a self perceived so-called mark, how can you go to this bourgeois women's march? Do you remember that? You know, and, and uh, as if it was some kind of, I'm proud to stand with women uh, who are fighting for reproductive rights. Well, most of the and women- What kind of Marxism is this, uh, uh, Michael? Is this the position yeah. of the Marxist movement? I think um, we do fight for all workers, which includes women, you know, of which, you know, make up more than half of our, our workforce. And so I think we hit the, the nail on the head when we said, you know, this is a working class issue. It's a democratic issue. But, for example, bourgeois women, they can if, if um, the, the court was to overturn Roe versus Wade, they could easily get access uh, to abortion, whereas working class women can't. Working class women are the ones that's going to have to do the back alley abortion or resort to some dangerous measure if they decide not to carry through a, a pregnancy. And so I think that, you know, for someone to dismiss women's rights or reproductive rights in, in general as a, a bourgeois issue, they're really missing, um, that they're ignoring half of the working class. And I don't think that's the way to, to um, that's not a Marxist position. But we're for bourgeois women having a right to an abortion too. Of course, it's a democratic and a working class. Um, I mean, please. You know, we're for democracy in general for everybody, no matter what their class is. You know, you start out along that path and you, uh, oh my God, it's a slippery slope to the right, you know? It's like the, the gender question and the race are all class questions. We, we support know? every freedom that can be shared equally by, um, by everybody, right? So the, the only so-called freedom that we don't support is freedom to use private property to, um, to exploit and oppress. So all the like uh, reproductive uh, freedom and all of that, you know, those are general basic democratic issues, like you said. There are circumstances though, when we do support the right. For example, we support the right under capitalism for African-Americans, Latino, Asian, and women to have businesses. As long as white men of property and capital own big businesses and, and there's a general democratic uh, the demand for small business, medium-sized African-American, Latino, we support that, right? It's not sure. the main part of our platform. 
but you know what I mean? Sure. I, um, I was in South Africa once and I made that point. The guy told me, I don't know about that, Joe. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> anyway, so this, this uh, fight for abortion is a very, the fascism is not going to uh, appear full blown. It's going to creep up on us, y'all. You got to fight every instance of the attempt to repress rights. Otherwise, you're going to end up, you're going to wake up one day, it's going to be too late. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be too, too late. Anyway, a lot of things have happened in the world today. Uh, Chile, uh, Honduras. Uh, is there a red wave going on in Latin America? Yo, what's, should I move to Chile, Rosana? I mean, not Chile, Honduras? not Chile, not Chile. No? Perhaps uh, Barbados or Honduras, where you know, both both uh, their new presidents are women, hmm. are left are left uh, thinking and in you know moving in a socialist direction. That's their platform. So um, I think that's something that we celebrate. Uh, you know, on the one hand, over here, where there's an attack on women, in the in you know in other parts of the world, the women are are victorious. They're being elected by large margins, not just you know, they're not on the edge. There were large margins of victory. So we need to also support them, how however we can hear from the United States. Hands off of Honduras and hands off of uh, Barbados. They called it a pink, a pink wave. They called pink it a wave. pink wave 20 years ago. Um, you know, when Hugo, <laughs> the when, yeah, the pink tie, that's right. Uh, 20 years ago when Hugo Chavez and um, other forces, the progressive left forces were coming to power democratically in, um, in uh, Latin America. And I think now we're seeing a resurgence of that. And I think it's important to note that a lot of these were long processes you know in the in the case of Barbados it's been a 55-year process to break with the British Empire and get rid of the monarchy as the head of state and so I think as Rosanna said that's very you know a progressive development and then you also have the case of Honduras which after the 2009 U.S. backed mm -hmm. coup which uh, ousted Manuel Zelaya his wife 12 years later after 12 years of resistance has been able to form this coalition of not just leftists and Marxists but they're leading a coalition of all working class people, whether they identify as centrists or social Democrats or communists, whatever. And they form this anti-extreme right people's front against imperialism, against corruption. And they were able to triumph by like a 20 point margin. Mm -hmm. And so I think going, looking at Chile, which as Rosanna said, you may not want to move there just yet, depending on how it goes. It's gonna really, um, we're gonna see which way it swings because this, this overall progressive shift in Latin America is reflected in Chile as well, but it's very polarized. They had their uh, primary elections on the 21st, I'm sorry, not primary, but first round presidential elections on the 21st. And uh, it was the communist backed candidate, Gabriel Boric, uh, and the extreme right um, son of a Nazi, literally son of a literal German Nazi, Jose Antonio Cast, as the two, you know, going into the second round. And the center has thrown their, their support behind um, Gabriel Boric, uh, the, the Christian Democrats and as well as other progressive and left forces, Allende Socialist Party. But um, Jose Antonio Cast was just here yesterday and the day before meeting with uh, Marco Rubio. Why is he here? You, you have the second round of elections on December 19th, and you're uh, here meeting with the right wing in the United States. And a very, um, Carmen Hertz, who's a, a, a communist member of Congress in Chile, she said, what is he doing in the United States? Mm -hmm. Is he planning another January 6th? And I think that's very important to consider that the world has their eyes on Latin America, but they also had their eyes on us on January 6th. So they know what, uh, what can happen if the extreme right really gains a foot. Well, we need to keep our eye on world. I'm not moving anywhere, uh, Scott. I'm staying here and fighting up to my last breath. Then maybe if after my last breath, you can take me anywhere you want. <laughs> But Joe, you know, it, it would yeah. be great. It would be great to vacation in Barbados, which is such a lovely place. And it's ironic that it's the one 
setting out as a republic now because of all of the British West Indies, that was the one that was seen as the closest to England. And it was called Little mm. England for a little yeah. while, for a while. So um, it was really heartening to hear um, the speeches at the ceremony that they had declaring themselves a republic. And I imagine that other, other places like uh, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago will, will follow suit um, in the future. So, and I like well, Rihanna. Well, as a uh, national hero. Everyone likes to I hope Puerto honest. Rico follows suit too, you know? Yes. <laughs> Not to, and I hope that they have an economic and social policy that they'll form alliances with the other progressive elements in Latin America against U.S. imperialism. Because you know, they're going to be, <laughs> you know how they do. And they kind of <laughs> choke, they put a chokehold and and they use all of their uh, economic and political tricks to undermine these these progressive uh, uh, development. Well, uh, more power to them, and uh, we got a big job to do here. And uh, and uh, the fight's going to get fierce come January and February. Now there's a new health a new health threat. What is it? What is the name of that new virus? What's it called? Omicron. 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 Yeah. Every I got my booster shot. And we encourage everybody to get booster shots. In fact, I'd get two if I could. <laughs> I mean, and uh, but you got to be careful because, by the way, we're having an event on to tomorrow. We're celebrating Jarvis Tyner's 80th birthday. We got greetings from uh, Angela Davis. And from uh, Blade and Zimande, got Blades this morning, the leader of the South African Party. He's a member of the uh, ANC-led government. He's a health, no, he's not the health minister. Health minister has a lot of problems there. He's the minister of education and many, many others. And uh, we'll be uh, uh, bringing greetings as well. We got a discussion question. It says, the socialist, um, economic policies cause inflation? And if so, what should we do about it? Anybody want to take a crack at that? The socialist economic policies create, Scott, got your hand up. Well, I was just going to say, I think that, you know, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, that inflation has been going on for a, a long time, and it, especially uh, in the stuff that working class people need to buy. Healthcare has um, gotten hugely more expensive. Education, hugely more expensive. Food prices have been growing up, have been going up. So um, this idea that um, when you give money to a working class people, all of a sudden the economy tanks is just a complete, it, it's, it's a propaganda line. It's designed to um, exploit people's economic anxiety. Um, the broader issue of inflation, it, it's always struck me as kind of a, like a deflection, right? In, worrying about inflation says, we're worried about the, 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 that our money can't buy enough, right? The money is not valuable enough. Um, when the real question is, do people have access to the things that they need for a decent life? Um, and, I think where socialist policy goes is um, ensuring that people have access to those things um, and uh, regardless of the, you know, what that means on the, the value of, of the hoarded cash of rich people. Um, so I think a lot of this inflation talk is, is fear mongering right now. Um, Paul Krugman recently suggested uh, that the uh, spending patterns among large corporations suggest that they don't see this um, inflationary trend continuing. And the other thing, the more important thing, like I said, is that um, I don't care how much hoarded cash buys. What I want to know is, do people have access to what they need? Um, you know what I think causes inflation? Capitalism causes inflation, not socialism. Didn't we have John Case here last week? And didn't he make the point that there were several contributing factors uh, to the inflationary 
One of them are supply chain, lack of access to some of the products and the prices are going up. And then he was talking about the oil issues in the Middle East and, and, and so on. And then I have a friend who's an economist uh, and my buddy who I went to school, he says that the reason that uh, is that they're trying to recoup the losses that, that, that they incurred during the pandemic. People weren't spending, they were at home. And so now that they got a little money in their pocket, they're raising prices in order to increase their profit margin. Do you think that that's true, anybody? I would say also we're paying the tariffs that the Trump administration put on China, Chinese imports, I mm. think. I mean, and, and also the, the tax uh, policies of the previous administration, too. I think, you know, inflation doesn't happen overnight. I think these are broader, uh, broader movements. And I and I do believe the people who have are many economists argue that it is temporary and this this is a very peculiar economy we've got right now it's just you know because of the pandemic it's it's completely unique circumstances so i don't think you can compare it to the 70s for example i think we just have to ride it out and hopefully it will be it will it will be diminishing by uh by um well in advance of the 22 uh, midterms and today, I think we got a good job. Did we get a good jobs report today? Today, the jobs report came out, and I think it's supposed to be. It's expected to be good. I don't know if it was, but you know, that would help. It was good. It was good. Well, that, but that, a lot of those are part-time seasonal jobs, so we have to keep that in mind too. All right. Well, you know, I think that capitalism is the cause of. You want to get rid of inflation, get rid of capitalism. That's right. I mean, that's the solution. It's not as simple as that, but that's the solution. Unless you, well, yeah, I mean, you get rid of eventual, eventually commodities and the the market of commodities where where inflation is built in, and that's the. Unless you want to have price process, controls. But... <laughs> Remember price mm -hmm. controls in the seventies? Was it the seventies? Who was that? Nixon. I forget. Oh, well, Nixon resigned in seventy four, so. Uh... That oh, might yeah, have that's... been Carter, but you know that kind of thing. Yes, I think it was. <laughs> You know, uh, you can't hold down the cost, the price of labor, so hold down the price of capital. Yeah. That's what I would do. Mm. But I mean, again, I'm not president. <laughs> <laughs> I don't control the Federal Reserve. I don't even have a bank account. Well, if I do, but there ain't much in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, season's greetings, everybody. And uh, we... Uh, uh, we're going to have a few more shows. Do we have any other events coming up next week, Michael? Or are we out for 2021? Well, we have uh, Jarvis's birthday tomorrow, which we encourage everyone to attend online if they cannot make it in person to the city. If you do make it to the city, please bring your vaccine card. Very important and a mask. Um, but if you want to attend online, you can go to um, uh, cpusa.org and find the link. Or you can also find it on any of our social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Come. He would want you to come. It's a big, think of it as a party event and kind of like a seasonal event as well. So we'll see you there. And happy birthday, Comrade Jarvis Tyner. Yes, happy birthday, well, you know, Comrade. Jarvis has such, a, has such a history. Like I found out recently that Jarvis participated. I'm kind of giving away what I'm going to say tomorrow. Jarvis mm. participated in one of the big, in fact, he led one of the big struggles to break the color line in this country. You know, it, 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 the time was the late 50s, early 60s. The place was Philadelphia. And the uh, circumstance was that Black people, white, Latino, they couldn't dance together publicly mm -hmm. on TV, on mm -hmm. American Bandstand. Now, I once, I saw Anita, you know, boogieing on American Band. I saw Rosanna <laughs> there, too. Michael and Scott weren't born yet. I was, <laughs> well, I was on Soul Train. I was on Soul Train. <laughs> You could not dance together. And, and, and there was a young guy from Philly, his name was Bobby Brooks, who had a hit song. And they were playing the song on American, and the people from the community couldn't even come dance mm. to the song. And so they had a protest. And there was a group called the Socialist Youth Union of Philadelphia. It was the party's youth group at the time. 
and the socialist was led by Jarvis Tyner, and that socialist youth union and the people in the community organized a protest, and they broke the back of segregation. And an American bandstand had to had had to relent. Big headline in the Philadelphia Inquirer: Color line broke on bandstand, hmm. and 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 that's our history. Yeah, that's part of what we did. But you never hear about it. You look on it online, you can't see that. You know, we have such a tremendous history of accomplishments and and, and struggle, but because of the suppression of information and the Cold War. Nobody knows about it, Rosanna. Mm -hmm. We need to bring forward that history. Yes, we I'm do. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Good. Good. I don't care what nobody says. I'm telling the <laughs> truth. Nobody's going to Are you going to talk uh, about Jarvis's uh, run for uh, mayor in 1986 or 87? Damn straight, I'm going to talk about it. Yeah, I, I collected yeah. signatures in that uh, in that race. Jarvis, I don't talk the about it. Right? I want Michael to. Michael is going to get a fundraising pitch tomorrow. You're giving him good ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going to celebrate. We got a lot to celebrate, y'all. This party, I'm telling you, and, and our greatest celebrations are yet to be held. Our, great, our greatest victories are coming. They're coming. They're right down the road. I can see them. <laughs> you know, Martin Luther King said, I've been to the mountaintop, and I've seen the other side. I kind of know what he was talking about, you know? But he was much higher <laughs> than we are. He had a mass movement behind him. You know, we are we are little, little ant here, but it's gonna grow. <laughs> so we encourage you to come and we encourage you to join the Communist Party. It's a revolutionary party fighting for a new society, socialism. Stay strong, stay safe, stay, stay in the fight, stay vaccinated, and we'll see y'all next week. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.